Hey, thanks for being here. Let's do some pod crashing. Episode number 200 is with Clayton English and Greg Glaude from War on Drugs. Uh, doing great. How are you? Hey, what's going on? Oh, man, I'm ready to talk. I'm ready to talk because this War on Drugs, man, this has been a part of my weekly reader lifestyle all the way back to the second grade, guys. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so when when does it become a world war on drugs instead of just a war on drugs? Well, that's a big, that's a big old question, isn't it? Uh, yeah. that's the whole world. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, you, you kind of look at the history of the war on drugs and a lot of it, you know, kind of began in America. And we'd like to kind of spread our, our stinky fingers over uh, everything. And so uh, the U.S., when they started kind of going through a lot of their prohibitionist policies, they didn't want to be alone. Uh, and so you kind of look historically and we put a lot of pressure uh, on other countries to kind of follow suit in what we're doing. So not only has like our U.S. war on drugs impacted the United States, it has had profound impacts across, you know, into Europe and Asia and South America and Central America and, and really trying to kind of crack down a lot of the things that we were doing because, yeah, like I said, we didn't want to be be alone uh, in, this, in this war. We wanted we wanted allies and enemies uh, all yeah. across the globe. And it's an international drug market, you know, the drugs more than likely are going to come from other places, you know, so it, I think it's it is it, it's, it's innately a part of it. It's a global issue. You know, well, I'm so glad that you brought that up because I mean that was one of the one things that I, when we first uh, invaded Afghanistan, the, one of the things that people said, "Oh my God, the poppy plants over there—that's the opium capital of the world. What's going to happen to opium?" And it was it was a huge component of it, and we're we're still kind of seeing the ramifications um, of that today. That you know that we had a lot of you know, uh, soldiers over there that got addicted right. uh, because of this, but also we were able to control trade markets of that. You know, it all kind of comes together. And for fentanyl, you don't need any of that. Uh, yeah, you don't need, need farming. Small lab. Right, exactly. One of the things that always got me was ephedrine was taken off the market. Ooh, it was bad. But what about these other drugs that people are using for painkillers? You're throwing out everything with the bad you know some of these drugs actually have a purpose even fentanyl actually has a purpose in the medical field right and it's a great drug for surgeries and doing things but because people are abusing it it's i mean it could look like and the way people are they could look like that drug could get taken off altogether so um i mean greg because if i remember correctly right it's it's fentanyl's good because you come out of being induced mm. and yeah yeah I mean, yeah, it was a miracle drug essentially for for surgical operations. You know, invented in the in the '60s. Um, you know, your dogs have fentanyl patches. These are it's like a miracle drug. But like, you know, to your point, um, or like, you know, it's it's kind of amazing how people do have a surgery. They get on these pain pills, and uh, once they actually have some sort of potential, um, you know, substance use issue with them, we cut them, and they either start going towards the illegal market or, or worse, you know, we spoke to uh, Maya Salvitz, who um, is an addiction expert uh, for the podcast. And she talked about, you know, these horrible stories of husbands and wives holding each Heart other's rate. hands while one, yep. you know, commits suicide because they can't take the pain anymore. And so I know what you're talking about with the surgery. My dad had knee surgery. He took, um, you know, they, they gave him, I, I think, Oxcon or one of those things. He had one place like, never again am I taking that. Um, and he just had it gritted out with Advil and uh, you know, kind of just going through it. Uh, so I don't blame you. It's it's very scary uh, when that stuff happens because if you do have an issue, um, we're very quick to cut off that supply and kind of try to just tell you, hey, go clean. And and for a lot of people, it's really really difficult, yeah. and we put them in really tough situations. Well, your your conversation with Eric Sterling drew me in. Oh my God! I mean, first of all, yeah. we're talking about Lynn Bias, and and I mean, it just it was such a. I, I didn't want it to end because I and I think you should bring him back because there's still more to his story. Oh, he has so much. You know, that was one of the things about doing this podcast. Like, it's so much information that, like, you know, we just tried to make it digestible. And, uh, yeah, that's definitely a person we would have to get back. And I think we might even have, like, uh, like some bonus content with him. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So let me ask you a question. I mean, to me, the war on drugs, all of a sudden, ephedrine disappears. Okay, I get it. I get it. But yet we still have these other drugs that are just as rampant as all can be. And even North Carolina announced yesterday, well, we're still trying to legalize medical marijuana. And it's like, wait a second. How are we supposed to win this war if they're if they're legalizing everything? Well, yeah. Well, so, yeah, I mean, for, for the medical aspects of marijuana, you know, I think one of the things that we've just kind of been able to 
show throughout the podcast is that our current prohibition practices are not accomplishing any of the goals that we want. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we're, we're not condoning substance abuse or substance use on, on the show at all, but just saying that the criminal justice system has been a very poor uh, regulator of this market. Um, but yeah, to your point, I mean, a lot of kind of what is illegal and what is not is fairly arbitrary. I mean, you look at, you know, marijuana at the federal level is still a controlled one substance. That means it has no medical value whatsoever. Um, and obviously that's that's not the case. Now, there are side effects and harmful negative consequences of, of habitual use of marijuana. And you see in some of these like weed shops and things like that, you know, you're looking at 80, 90 percent THC and that can yep, really mess yep. up a kid. Um, at those levels. And so we we have this kind of weird relationship with it. But at the same time, there's obviously some benefits. And when you're categorizing that in the same you know category as, you know, it's actually, you know, cocaine's a schedule two substance and, you know, marijuana is a schedule one. It's all very arbitrary what we allow to be legal, what we allow people to put in their bodies and whatnot. And, you know, evidence and science has not been leading the day on the drug war. It's been much more fear and kind of rash thinking and that's something that we see throughout this time there's some you know a lend bias happens or there's a story out of florida where some kid went crazy on lsd and then we all start scrambling and you know just start prohibiting it. instead of saying like let's take a deep breath let's research this stuff let's understand the benefits the negatives and move on from there from a regulatory standpoint and we just are horrible at that as a, you know as an institution in the united states and so i think that's the big problem there is that science has never led with this or healthcare has never led with this it's always been kind of fear and kind of governments you know politics as as usual don't you think i'm sorry I, I'm, I'm sorry i'm still true I'm sorry, I'm still tripping off. You said ephedrine. That's like an old drug. Right? <laughs> Just thinking about how many drugs have gotten canceled and taken off the market. Like, yeah, like I've never actually seen a barbiturate. I remember learning about it in the <laughs> DARE program, but I have no idea what they are. But yeah, sorry, go ahead. Bring back the Quaaludes. Oh, oh yeah, the Quaaludes. Hey, that Wolf of Wall Street scene has me yeah. like, yeah, very scared. <laughs> You're so right about that because I would love to sit through a D.A.R.E. program now and see what what exactly they're talking about. Yeah, because I guarantee you half of it wasn't out yet. <laughs> <laughs> You know, so many people have associated the war on drugs with Nancy Reagan, but my God, you guys are one of the very first people to say, no, guys, this actually started with President Richard Nixon. Yeah, and it probably even goes further back further than back. that. Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, Nixon was obviously, you know, he declared a war on drugs and he was kind of one of the, you know, the first ones to kind of officially uh, pronounce it a, a war. But, you know, you kind of look back all the way, you know, we talked to Johan Hari, um, who has an amazing book, Chase and Scream, and he talks about, you know, how Harry Anslinger um, kind of took over what's the modern day DEA, yeah. uh, you know, after prohibition. So you have all these agents, you have all this huge government agency that was, you know, cracking down on people being bootleggers and, you know, in the illegal alcohol trade, and they needed something to do. And that kind of started tying into the drug war. And that really is like the impetus and the origin story of the drug war. But yeah, then it follows up through Richard Nixon with with marijuana and all you see is always like we have political opponents so during that time is the black panthers the hippies kind of this free love movement during the vietnam war it's like well how does the government control these people we can't you know charge them with you know heavy crimes of murder and you know arson those are few and far between but drugs we can get our hands on that and so what you see a lot of the time it's a war on people clayton says this all the time sorry to steal your line here it's a war on people not necessarily a war on drugs mm -hmm. we're able it's to kind of hit Right, exactly. No, I'm just <laughs> mm, 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 mm. I I, I got to ask you though: uh, Will there ever be a podcast that's based on the drug of choice for the men and women that are coming back from Iraq, Afghanistan? And let's be honest, they're coming back from Ukraine too. We just don't, we just aren't talking about it. But there is a drug of choice, and and I think that you know I don't, I don't want to see any you know late night uh, commercials on TV that said if you were part of. I mean, we need to we need to tackle this now. Yeah, so what um, the drug of choice you're talking about is um, is what? Yeah, uh, fill me in. I'm, I'm yeah. curious. Yeah. Well, that, that, that's what too. I'm trying to figure out because I mean because they're coming home, but where are they escaping? Uh, okay. You know, I, I want I want to know so that we can help them now and not not stand on the other side of this going well crap we should have known we should have known we should have learned from the vietnam war we should have learned from all these other because I mean to this day I mean we we keep hearing about the drug abuse for, that happened during Vietnam. Yeah, I think I think some of that uh, Greg will probably talk more to it, but some of that is just gonna come down to how we treat addiction, right? You know, in in general, um, because it's like like 
I mean, we're joking about it, but it's going to be something else. You know, like fentanyl is now, it's not going to stop probably. So the way we approach people addiction and we treat it like a sickness, if we actually start getting people on the path to being well, I think that's one of the first steps, you know? Yeah. Just, yeah. Yeah, Clayton, I think you hit it on the head. And, you know, right now what we're seeing, unfortunately, is, you know, fentanyl really overtake, um, you know, the American streets. And, you know, really heroin is not going to be, um, a, a drug that's really out there and you right. kind of see to yourself, oh, that's a good thing. But no, it's because fentanyl is kind of overtaking it. And to your point, I think that's our fear, you know, as this, you know, the Ukraine war continues and other people coming back, obviously the military has immense, um, you know, issues with PTSD, mental health issues, substance use when they come back. And so I think we're going to see this again. And I think fentanyl um, is really going to start being that drug of choice, unfortunately. And that is a really, really dangerous substance. And we don't have a great plan for how we, we kind of bring people back and, and move through. Um, we talked um, to uh, Jesse Goals, who runs an organization that helps people, um, you know, veterans suffering from PTSD actually go on ayahuasca trips, yes. um, which yep. is really fascinating. Yep. And, you know, he talks a lot about just how the VA, you go there and you say, you know, I have these issues. And finally, once you're able to see someone after, you know, months and months and months, all they want to do is just pump you with all these other substances. And for him, he was saying it was causing me depression and it was yep. causing me all these things. So he took matters in his own hands. Um, you know, I, I think that's one area that potentially, you know, could really help our military and troops is kind of looking at some of the therapeutics um, that are coming out there from psychedelics like MDMA or psilocybin and things like that that have shown to really, really actually help with these types of things rather than a lot of the, you know, pharmaceutical company, you know, options and solutions that we have here that really actually drive people much more into depression a lot of the times. It's uh, but to your point, I think we're going to see a lot more substance abuse coming back from people that are serving right now overseas in Ukraine. And as we've seen in other wars, yeah, for sure. It, what, what is so incredible, uh, incredible about this podcast is the fact that it, you're in the front seat of the car with me. You're in my office with me and, and, and you present it in a way that, that, that does, does not offend me. It teaches me. It helps me understand. It, it's like you're educating the public and 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 at the same time you're 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 also saying we can do this let's work together and and we've never had a podcast like this before it was kind of oh go ahead clinton sorry oh yeah i was just gonna say like um it was kind of crazy when we were talking about doing this and we were like oh the war on drugs that has to be taken as a podcast name and it wasn't and i was like oh yeah (laughs) we were like well maybe we're on to something here um, that it hasn't really been explored in this way. And yeah, really kind of looking through the content of other podcasts, it just, it felt like there was this gap. And so I really appreciate you saying that because that was exactly what we were trying to do. We really weren't trying to like force a narrative or push that, you know, drugs are fine. You know, it, it was really to show the harmful side effects, the actual realities of what this drug war is and kind of leading through that time period and how it impacts different points of American life and bring on the best people that we could um, and yeah. try to make it as entertaining as possible when it's such a sobering issue. But um, yeah, that was kind of the goal and, and hopefully we're hitting it. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly it, man. How, how did you guys even prepare for that conversation with Eric Andre? Because that it, it, there's no way that it was just one of those things where you sat down in the studio and said, all right, let's go for this. You guys did some serious show prep on that. That's my guy. So like, I know him, I've worked with him before from comedy and uh, stand up and actually like, the whole situation that we have the legal case. Uh, I just reached out to him because the same thing had happened to me. So mm. I've been in contact with him for a while. So it was really just kind of like me asking like, hey, if, would you come down and come over here? And then once he got on board, we just made sure we got everything together and we, you know, we wanted to make sure we rolled it out for. Him. Well, yeah. to, to be to be so open though, Clayton, my God, I mean, m- most people when they get on the microphone, I mean, being on stage is one thing, and 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 sharing your truth up there is one thing, but when you share it through a podcast, oh my God, I mean, I can hit replay a billion times. Yeah, yeah, and um, I think that's that's what we want this podcast to have. We want it to have legs. We want you to tell somebody else to listen to it. We want you to you know, get together after listening to it and talk about what you heard and do more research. And I also like that Greg's always got like a call to action because it's so much stuff you look at and you uh, get bombarded with information and it's like, okay, you kind of feel helpless because you don't know what you can do. Right. And I think uh, we do a pretty good job of letting people know where to begin on getting on the path to get some of these things that, you know, we say we want as a society. 
Well, the the one thing I've always wondered, though, only because I'm on this side of, of the drug war, is the fact that is this a political tool or do we really have a situation here? Because it seems like every politician is talking about it, but you never see anything done. Yeah, I, I think that's I think that's exactly right. It, it feels like a, a kind of a, a utilization that you're able to weaponize when you're in, um, you know, in political power uh, one way or the other. And, you know, it's a lot of grandstanding, it's a lot of rhetoric. It's still this horrible misunderstanding of what addiction is and how to effectively treat it. You know, we, we talked to Johan Hari, like I talked about before, and, you know, he you know, talks about this, you know, experiment called Rat Park, where, you know, you know, this is where a lot of our addiction knowledge came from that we put a, ca- a rat in a cage and we gave him water with cocaine and water without and finally the rat starts going to the water with cocaine because he has nothing to do and then 30 years later someone does this experiment again and makes rat park and it's a bunch of other rats and you can you're associating you have all the food you want all the wheels you want yeah. all this stuff that you want and the rats stop going to the cocaine and it just shows that you know we're throwing people essentially in in a cage by themselves when we put them in jail with no treatment no therapy no some no nothing and then we're expecting them to get better. And we, we have this horrible misrepresentation of what addiction is. And our politicians and our policy continues to essentially go the complete opposite way and actually exacerbate addiction issues rather than just looking at the medical science. And we've gone so far into it now, it's really gonna be hard to put the two, toothpaste back of the tube because there's been so much mi- misinformation and miseducation about what the drug were. I mean, us you know, going through the DARE programs yep. and all these other things, You know, we, we just have this weird um, misunderstanding of what addiction is and how to actually come on the other side. I, I, it's going to take a while, but there are these little glimmers of hope that I think we see uh, people more and more understanding. And a lot of it, yeah. unfortunately, has to do with like the opioid epidemic kind of hitting, you know, a lot of suburban and rural areas yeah. now rather than just kind of being an inner city issue. And so more yeah. people are opening their eyes to this. Yeah. yeah, I think that's what's got the politicians like being a little bit more open to understanding ways to treat addiction because I think before it was just that fear campaign, that fear monger, yep, you know, yep. these people are, these people are animals on drugs. You know, if somebody's on crack, they're gone. If somebody smokes meth, there's, you know, there's nothing you can do with them. So I think now that people are seeing it like in so many different forms and hitting people that are close to them and it's actually in their community, I think that's increased the, the politicians you know, uh, ability to kind of want to, I guess, talk about it. You know, Greg, you're the one on the policy stuff. So, uh, yeah. Well, Clayton, I got to tell you something. You being creative, I come from a creative world. I believe that addiction starts with creativity. And I think that people can't feed that monster, so they go searching for things. And I wish people would start talking about that. What are you doing with your creativity? Please find an answer because I don't need you to go to drugs. Yeah. Yeah, that connection. That connection, that community. Um, for me, it was comedy, you know, it was, and then also, uh, unfortunately comedy has like a blueprint of (laughs) what drugs will do to you. So, uh, you kind of like, if you, you gotta have something that you want to do so that it keeps you from just going into trying to numb your whole life away. I think we talked about that on that Dr. Phil thing. Yeah. Wow. Absolutely. Wow. You guys, I, I could spend two, two hours or two days with you. I mean, I mean, this is a subject that needs to have a conversation and I'm so blessed to hear your, your podcast. And, and I just, I cannot wait to find out what you guys are going to continue to add to this. The war on drugs, which is now on iHeartRadio. Please come back to this show anytime. The door is always going to be open for you. I really appreciate it. Yeah. We're, we're really excited as we keep rolling out episodes every Wednesday. So Definitely yes. subscribe to us wherever you find podcasts. And I really appreciate the time. And we'd love to come back and continue to chat about this as things come up. Yeah, give us a listen. Absolutely. You be brilliant today, okay? You too. You too, man. Thank you. I love that. Thank you.